I'm also going to try without the mic, so if in back you can't hear me, just uh, just shout. Uh, so at the outset, I want to just point out that this work has been uh, has involved a lot of people, and in particular, Kevin Kosat. Kosat is the one who's really driven a lot of this work. He was a student and then a postdoc in my lab who since moved on to bigger and better things. I also, at the outset, want to acknowledge uh, funding sources, both NSF and actually NASA have sort of indirectly uh, contributed to some of this work. So over, well, at least over my academic career, the understanding of animal phylogeny has changed quite a bit. And so we now know things like bilateral animals consist of three major groups. Uh, Lophotrochozoa, ecdysozoa, and deuterostomes. Various studies have repeatedly recovered those groups. Those groups are well supported and very robust. Whereas we have a good understanding of the relationships within deuterostomes and ecdysozoa, and within this group here, it's been much more challenging. Um, and an understanding of the relationships has been slow in coming. Some of the things we do generally see as you look across previous studies is that this Lophotrochozoa group may be split into two different groups of animals, Trochozoa and Platyzoa. Trochozoa are things like mollusks, annelids, nemertines. Uh, we also throw in things like bracket pods and drones there now. Platyzoa are things like flatworms, and then many of these myofaunal types of organisms, in particular things like gastrotrichs, nathostomulids. We also have rotifers and acanthocephala. Uh, within there. And then we also have a couple other things, rhizomes, entoprox, sickly offers. But our understanding of the relationships of these groups is, has actually uh, not really panned out well and we keep trying to do more and more to understand what's going on. Uh, the Dunn study was mentioned earlier today. That was a very seminal study in terms of taking a very big look of what's going on. And now we're in the era, of course, of using transcriptomes and genomes to try to understand invertebrate phylogeny. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is a, is a study uh, that we've been doing. I just want to try to give you a framework of the approach we've been taking uh, to do this work. I'm not going to hit it that, because of time. Obviously, I can't hit on all the, the conclusions and details. Uh, but I just sort of want to give you a feel for the approach. <coughs> One of the big things that we've done in trying to pick uh, transcriptomes and genomes is try to avoid taxa with missing data. And in particular, what I mean by this is a lot of the previous studies that have taken a phylogenomic perspective since about 2000, really 2005 on, initially used EST Sanger data sets. And then there was a period around 10, 11, 12 where you saw a lot of 454 data sets. And now about 14, 15, 2014, 15, you're seeing a lot of Illumina data sets. The Illumina data sets are much deeper. And so we've actually tried to avoid using a lot of this ANDST and 545 data because it's just not as, as deep as, as we would like. The other thing when we thought about this is we took a careful look at the tax that we were picking. We know from previous studies that some taxa have long branches. Sometimes we can't afford this. Things like rhizomes tend to be long branches, but you have to have them in the tree. Whereas other things you can avoid, when you look across platyhelminths, there are some with shorter branches, and we tend to avoid some of the parasitic groups, which have really long, elevated branches. Now, there are several taxa, not several, there are a few taxa we didn't include. Um, some of these, like Micronathozoa, we didn't include because it's known for one locality in Greenland and it takes about three days to get there to collect it. Um, and then there are a couple other parasitic groups which um, there actually haven't been really good studies on yet where they fit into animal phylogeny. They may or may not be inside Lophotrochozoa. So we took a look at 74 taxa, but I'll come back to that in a second. As with uh, any of these phylogenomic analyses, uh, somebody like myself, I was an old dog, had to learn new tricks with getting on top of computation and stuff like that. And this is where I'm very grateful to my postdocs and students because they pushed me along in terms of loop in learning uh, computational approaches. But basically, we have developed a pipeline. This is actually 
was originally designed to be very similar to the Dunn et al. pipeline and, and Casey's pipeline and our pipeline have grown slightly, but they do very similar types of things. Um, we start with the raw reads, of course, through assemblies, translated into amino acids, and then we get into this whole middle section where it really becomes curating and filtering the data. And one of the most important things is the orthology issues and making sure that you nail your orthology uh, groups and that you're assigning genes to the right orthology groups. And so we have several steps to deal with that. Uh, one of the big ways we do it is using Hamster. And so Hamster uses the imparanoid data set and has sets of four orthologs that are available. So you can take your data and blast to these well-curated known orthologs. Uh, that has been very successful. We're actually at the point now where instead of just taking the core orthologs, we're developing our own core ortholog sets because we're finding that if we develop our own core ortholog sets, we actually recover many more genes. So what this represents here is uh, in the larger trochozoa data set, the core ortholog set had 1,032 genes. When we put the whole data set together, we ended up with 301. If we develop our own taxon-specific core orthodox set, we can pretty much double those numbers. So we can bring a lot more data to bear on these types of questions. And we've done this with a couple of different studies. We've done it, the one I'm talking about here, the one Nathan just talked about, we've played with it. Abel Coffer and Moss Mullis, we've done it as well. And so uh, for this data set, we actually went in and developed a core orthologue set using a wide variety of taxa. And this was done by a all, an all versus all blast in ortho MCL, which is another program. OK, so to give you a little bit about the data matrix, uh, we ended up with 74 taxa, 638 genes, about 122,000 uh, amino acids. And then we come to this, uh, this issue down here about data matrix occupancy. Things have really have been changing. And uh, we know, for example, <coughs> that when people first started to do phylogenomic analyses, a lot of the data sets maybe had 30 or 40 percent data present <coughs> and 50, 60, 70 percent data missing. We've gotten a lot better. Sonia's talk earlier has mentioned 95 percent, which is awesome getting it that full. Um, we're at about 70%. And we've played around with missing data, and we know we're in a pretty good range, and it's not going to affect uh, too much. Now, some of the other things we've done after determining orthology, we've gone and we've used, as uh, Nathan mentioned, tree specs to look at various sources of um, phylogenetic error, systematic error. And then we've gone on and done basically Bayesian or likelihood analyses. So uh, I'm going to skip over a lot of, of what we did there. Now, in terms of the analyses, we ended up doing uh, two things. We've ended up using RaxML. Um, yes, I know there's RaxML 8 out, but some of these were run a little bit ago. Here we partitioned by gene. Uh, we also tried to use Phylobase. And as Nathan just mentioned, uh, there have been some issues with this because if we try to use a site-specific rate heterogeneous model, as people have uh, in the literature argued you should do, it is not computationally feasible on these sizes of data sets. So even taking uh, 106 genes or ethology groups, trying to run four chains using about uh, 70 CPUs, uh, we only finished about 1,500 or 15,000 cycles, that took six months to do, and we were nowhere near convergence. So at this point, we sort of pulled the plug and said, you know, we would be literally waiting decades for the uh, analysis to finish. So we didn't do, I'm not going to show you phytobase. We tried, couldn't do it. Okay, so from that main data set, uh, these are the general results here. Uh, we get two major groups. We get a trochozoa group and a platyzoa group. Um, the file are indicated here. You'll notice mollusks are a little oversampled. Uh, for those of you who know Kevin Kosad, you'll understand why mollusks are oversampled. Uh, but basically, this grew out of a project to take a second look at mollusk phylogeny and see where scaphopods fit in, and then we sort of blew it up to a larger project. Uh, within Lofotrochozoa, we get really good bootstrap support 
for a trochozoa clade. However, within that clade, um, bootstrap support really dropped. Now, we recover the phyla as monophyletic, but we're not getting good sets of relationships between the taxa. But this, this main tree had annelids and nematines going together. Brachypods and pheronids were sister to them. And then uh, that was all, mollusks were sister to all of them. Now, the platyzoa, we tended to get a lot stronger support. And the branches within here are all very high, 99 or 100 bootstrap. But as you can see, the sampling is a lot more limited. And then we have things like how those relate to the entoprox, cycliophorans, and rhizoans. And again, support is not so good. Um, so what do you do with that? Well, one thing you try to do is look for sources of air. So we've done a series of sensitivity analyses. Um, these are the main parameters we've looked at. We've looked at a uh, long branch measure. We've looked at patristic distances, percent of missing data, uh, this was mentioned earlier, the RCFE, which is really a measure of amino acid composition, and a measure of saturation, which is just at the slope of patristic distance versus uncorrected p-distance. Now, one of the great things about going this route is all of these factors can be parameterized. You can actually stick a value on it. One of the things we've suffered with in phylogenetic analyses is talking in particular about long branch and long branch attraction. This is usually people look at it, eyeball it, play with some parameters. If you get a different tree, you say, oh, it's long branch attraction. And that's actually not a very objective way to go about things. So we tried to parameter, well, we didn't try. We did parameterize these things. We dropped them into a PCA analysis to see how all these variables interact with each other. And most of the variance in the data was explained by amino acid composition and patristic distances. They sort of seem to go together. And then the next biggest set of variables was uh, the LB score for measuring long branches and missing data. It makes sense that these go hand in hand because in these analyses, if you have a lot of missing data, it actually tends to inflate the branch length artificially. Okay, so they, those two go hand in hand. Now, to try to get at what was going on, in these analyses, basically in addition to that main data set, we ran another 66 data sets. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all 66 data sets. There's not time for that. Um, but what we did is we took the uh, 630, 638 uh, OG groups, and for each parameter, we ranked them. And then from that ranking, we took, uh, we divided it up into sex tiles. So we took the best, what amounted to 106 genes based on the LB score, and then the best two uh, sextiles based on LB score, the best three, and so on. And we ran analyses on those individuals. Okay? We did that for all of these factors as well. So uh, we really tried to dissect the data and understand what was going on. The reason we divided into sextiles is it gave us equally sized um, uh, data sets. In addition to that, we also took these scores, ranked them, and then sort of looked for natural breaks. So for some of the things, some of the things there were um, uh, long branches, there were two or three taxa which were clearly longer than everything else, and we cut them out and tried to see what was going on. So the problem is trying to sum all those up, and it's not an easy task, so what we ended up doing is looking at individual hypotheses of taxa that go together across all of these 66 analyses and try to get a feel for which hypotheses were well supported, like bracket pod and coronet going together, and which were poorly supported, like uh, eutrochozoa going together. Now, just to wrap up and give you uh, at least some hint of what we've seen, is uh, first dealing with trochozoa, this group comes out really strongly supported. However, when we did the initial data set, we got annelids and nematines going together. When we started controlling for some of the sources of air, we settled a little bit more on this, on this result here. The main difference being whether nematines are close to annelids or nematines are sister to the whole group. And so that's still uh, not clear. What we didn't get was this next one, where mollusks were sister to brachiopods and coronas, which has been suggested previously. 
Uh, some of the other ideas that have been floated out there, which we really never saw support for, were Entoprox going close to Mullis, or the idea of local forates. And then the other big issue is whether the platyzo are monophyletic or paraphyletic. And uh, from the results we had, we were getting platyzoa as monophyletic, although our taxon sampling there needs to be beefed up. And I think I'm out of time, and I will stop there.